The next item of business is a statement by Nicola Sturgeon on historical adoption practices. The First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. First Minister. Presiding officer, the issuing of a formal apology is an action reserved by governments as a response to the worst injustices in our history. Without doubt, the adoption practices that prevailed in this country for decades during the 20th century fit that description. And for the people affected by these practices, I appreciate that an apology has been a very long time coming. One of the most ardent campaigners for it has been Marion McMillan. In the mid-1960s, Marion was a teenager living in Stranraer. When she became pregnant, she was sent to a mother and baby home in the north of England. Marion has described the horror of having her son taken away from her. I remember crying and telling them, but I'm his mummy and begging them not to take my son. I was told not to be silly, I'd get over it, and I could always have other babies when I was married. Elspeth Ross faced her own ordeal. In 1962, she gave birth to her son in a mother and baby home in Glasgow. After I had my son, I was in the nursery for six weeks looking after him, but nobody told me they were taking him away. I was upstairs the very last day and told to pack my bags and go, not knowing that I was never seeing my son again. In 1979, Jano Farmer gave birth at the age of 22. She has recounted the moment in the hospital when she was told that her baby was being adopted. I was treated in quite humiliating ways from the outset. I didn't understand at that time that I had lost the decision that the decision had been made for me. I didn't understand that until the social worker appeared after the birth. The horror of what happened to these women is almost impossible to comprehend. It is the stuff of nightmares, yet these were not isolated cases, far from it. Until the late 1970s, forced adoption was a relatively common practice in Scotland. Many thousands of children were subject to it. In most cases, their mothers were young or unmarried. They were stigmatised as a result, and they were forced or coerced into the adoption process by charities, churches, health professionals, and social services. Some mothers suffered physical mistreatment or abuse. Some were denied appropriate health care. Up until the early 1970s, mothers in some cases were given Stilbestro, a drug that dried up their breast milk and which is potentially carcinogenic. Virtually all of the mothers were made to feel worthless. Among many falsehoods, they were told that they had nothing to offer their child except state benefits. They were told that without adoption, their child would grow up a delinquent and that they were selfish for wanting to keep their baby because they would be denying them a so-called better life. Consistently, mothers were lied to about the adoption process. They were given no information about what was happening. When they did object, they were bullied or ignored. Some women were never even allowed to hold their babies. Most never got the chance to say a proper goodbye, and many were threatened with terrible consequences if they ever tried to make contact with their child. For these mothers, it was a living nightmare, a nightmare from which they've never truly been able to wake. The grief, heartbreak and shame of what happened has been a constant throughout their lives. And many have had to bear this trauma in silence for fear of other people's judgment or pity. It has affected their relationships, relationships with subsequent children, with partners and with family and friends. And for many, it has created serious mental health impacts that persist to this very day. For the sons and daughters who were taken, of course, 
the impacts have also been profound. Now, it is important to say, and to say very clearly, that many of them went to loving homes. Acknowledging these injustices should never be seen as a rejection of the deep bonds that people share with their adopted families. Nothing can ever invalidate the love that these families have for one another. But it is also clear that many of those affected, far too many, had a very, very different experience. We know some will always have lacked a sense of belonging. Some may even have suffered mistreatment or abuse. And all of them will have grown up believing that their mothers chose to put them up for adoption of their own free will. Understandably, that has affected them, and yet it was never true. As adults, the practical difficulties of accessing adoption records have been a further torment. Even when families have been able to reconnect, that in itself has brought huge emotional challenges. And sometimes the search has ended in further heartache when the person being looked for is already deceased. For the fathers affected, there has also been great suffering. They too lost a child. They too had their rights denied by a system that ignored and dehumanised them. There's good reason to believe that some mothers weren't even allowed to put the father's names on the birth certificate, a permanent obstacle to reuniting with their son or daughter. And of course, the impact of what happened has been felt more widely by the loved ones of everyone involved. The legacy of these practices continues to affect generations of families in this country and beyond. It is a level of injustice which is hard now for us to comprehend. So today, how do we even begin to explain how such appalling acts could take place? Obviously, they were the product of a society where women were regarded as second-class citizens, where unmarried mothers were stigmatised, and where people in authority had too much power. We also know that similar practices happened in other countries. But that does not, for a moment, excuse the appalling mistreatment people suffered nor does it absolve the individuals and institutions involved. After all, it is not just in hindsight that these practices are wrong. Mistreating women and forcing them to part with their babies was never right. It was always cruel, unjust and profoundly wrong. Now, there's a line of argument which says that because the government of the time did not support these practices, there's nothing to apologise for. And that anyway, these events took place long ago before this parliament reconvened and anyone in this chamber held public office. But these are not reasons to stay silent. Ultimately, it is the state that is morally responsible for setting standards and protecting people. So as modern representatives of the state, I believe we, amongst others, have a special responsibility to the people affected. First, we have a responsibility to do whatever we can to support them in dealing with the legacy of what happened. That's why last year the Scottish Government established specialist support and counselling services for those affected by historical adoption practices. At the same time, we launched a consultation asking people affected to share their experiences. I want to take this opportunity today to thank everyone who responded. We have since commissioned a study which will report later this summer on how we can improve the support that people can access, from psychological support to help in reuniting with family members. And we will continue to explore with those affected the key challenges that they face with regard to adoption records and the lasting health impacts faced by mothers who were given still be strong. On that final point, I want to emphasise again today the importance of women attending routine breast and cervical screening appointments. Another responsibility we have to them, of course, is to provide an assurance that the lessons of this period have been learned. There's no doubt that adoption practices and our society in general have come a long way in the decades since, but we can never, ever allow ourselves to be complacent. At all times, we must ensure that the services which are meant to protect families fulfil that role as effectively and compassionately as possible. That's why this government is so focused on delivering the conclusions of the independent care review, the promise which emphasised the importance, where possible, of keeping families together. 
And more generally, we need to continue to build a society where women and girls are treated equally and where everyone's human rights are respected. That has always been a central mission of this government and it is how we ensure that such injustices never happen again. The final way in which we can keep faith with those affected is more symbolic, but no less meaningful for that. It is something that has been campaigned for tirelessly over many years by many of the people seated in our gallery today. And it's a cause which I know has been championed by members across this chamber. As a government and a parliament, we can set the record straight. We can acknowledge the terrible wrongs that were done. And we can say with one voice that we are sorry. So today, as First Minister, on behalf of the Scottish Government, I say directly to the mothers who had their babies taken away from them, to the sons and the daughters who were separated from their parents, to the fathers who were denied their rights, and to the families who have lived with the legacy. For the decades of pain that you have suffered, I offer today a sincere, heartfelt and unreserved apology. We are sorry. No words can ever make up for what has happened to you, but I hope this apology will bring you some measure of solace. It is the very least that you deserve, and it is long overdue. Thank you. The First Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on. I would be grateful if all members who wish to ask a question were to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to thank the First Minister for advance sight of her statement. And can I begin by associating the Scottish Conservatives with the statement made by Nicola Sturgeon? We are joined in the Chamber by the courageous campaigners of historic force adoption. Today would not have been possible without them and their determination to seek a sincere national apology after 60,000 women were forced to give up their babies for adoption simply because they were young or unmarried. Although a national apology cannot right the wrongs of the past, but for those suffering lifelong trauma, it will be the start of a healing process. My only regret is that many campaigners have sadly died before this apology was made. We need to make sure that this part of history will never repeat itself and that we protect the rights of women and children in Scotland. So, in relation to the Commission's study, can I ask the First Minister if this will be trauma-informed and that the support being offered is meaningful and needs-based? First Minister. Um, can I thank Megan Gallagher for her question and uh, for associating uh, her party uh, with the apology that has been offered today. Um, let me give an assurance uh, that while I recognise and understand completely the importance of offering an apology today, it is in uh, many respects not the end uh, of this process. Uh, there is much work still to do uh, to understand the impact of these horrendous practices, but also to ensure that we offer as much appropriate support as we can in the months and years to come uh, for those who are still dealing with the impact of that trauma. Uh, so I give a commitment today uh, that any uh, work done by the Scottish Government uh, will always be trauma informed and that we will work to ensure uh, and do this uh, together uh, with those in the gallery, campaigners uh, and everyone across our country that has been affected by these practices to ensure that the support that they need now and in the future is provided. Um, and I know this is something uh, that the person who succeeds me as First Minister will give uh, as much importance to as I and my government have done. Jackie Bailey. Can I too thank the First Minister for her formal apology and on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party echo her remarks. 
We believe that there are an estimated 60,000 Scottish mothers who were compelled to give up a baby for adoption simply because they were unmarried in the 50s, 60s and even into the 70s. And these cruelties are among the most appalling of injustices that our society has inflicted on women and their children. Marion Macmillan from Paisley is one of those mothers. She is now in her 70s and terminally ill. Her wish is that the victims in Scotland receive the apology they deserve. And I welcome her and all the other women who have bravely campaigned for so long to the public gallery. Marion has, of course, worked with other victims of forced adoption from around the world. She has reunited mothers with children and has given evidence that helped to secure the world's first government apology for forced adoption, which was in Australia in 2013. We commend the brave and tireless work of Marion and all the other campaigners. But let me also pay tribute to Marion Scott at the Sunday Post for her very tenacious support for these women. MSPs from across parties have lobbied the Scottish Government. It was, of course, Neil Bibby that first raised this way back in 2015, and the issue has been taken up since by my colleague Monica Lennon and indeed others. It is right and beyond time that there is a formal apology in Scotland for the injustice of forced adoption and to confront this shameful chapter in Scotland's history. For some, the apology will bring closure. For others, it is the start, not the end. Will the First Minister, therefore, commit her government to a firm timetable beyond the study that will give these women and their children access to appropriate health services, including trauma-informed counselling and easier access to adoption records? First Minister. Uh, can I thank Jackie Bailey for a question? And uh, can I thank the Scottish Labour Party for associating themselves with today's apology. Um, there are members across the chamber who have campaigned uh, for uh, the apology that has been offered uh, today. Uh, I too uh, would make particular mention of Monica Lennon, who has done uh, a great deal uh, to advance this cause. Uh, one of the tragedies uh, of this situation, one of the many tragedies of this situation, is that we don't know for certain how many uh, were affected uh, by forced adoption practices. Uh, according to the National Record of Scotland statistics, from 1930 until 1979, there were approximately 73,000 adoptions uh, recorded in Scotland. But there is no data available for this period uh, to tell us how many of these adoptions occurred without the birth mother's informed uh, consent. Um, so not knowing uh, the precise data is, as I say, uh, one of the many tragedies of this. We also know that there are uh, many uh, mothers uh, who were forced to give up their babies in Scotland who now live in other countries. I know, for example, that we have uh, at least one person from Australia with us in the public gallery uh, today. Uh, so the impact of this, the depth of this uh, and the suffering from this is impossible for any of us to properly uh, quantify. That is what makes it so important uh, that we do firstly issue this apology, but secondly make sure uh, that we continue to work with those affected. And I again pay tribute to the women uh, with us in the gallery today and to the many others, some of whom will no longer be uh, with us. Uh, who out of their own uh, trauma and suffering have campaigned for justice and to stop this ever happening to others. Uh, it is absolutely essential that we work to identify the appropriate support uh, and that part of the process is really important. And then as government implement that support across all of the uh, different areas that are necessary as quickly as possible. As everyone knows, this time next week there will be a new First Minister here. Uh, and whoever that is, I have no doubt uh, that they will give this the same commitment as my government has. Uh, and I'm sure all of us across this chamber uh, will be doing everything we can to hold the government to account on that. Rona Mackay, to be followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is a momentous day for at least 60,000 mothers who were forced to give up their child, not least of all Marion McMillan and the other brave campaigners who have spent their lives fighting this heartbreaking injustice. Um, does the First Minister agree with me that this dark period in our history should never be forgotten and should inspire progressive policies to ensure nothing like this ever happens again? First Minister. Um, yes, I wholeheartedly agree with this. Uh, this is a historic practice. 
Uh, but we must never be complacent. Uh, we must make sure that every single day that we are guarding against any injustice like this ever, ever happening again. Uh, that's why some of the wider work that the Scottish Government is doing is so important. I referenced in my statement the independent care review and the promise uh, that came from that. Uh, this Government is committed to keeping the promise. Uh, we must also continue our work to lift children out of poverty. Sadly, we know that children growing up in poverty are more likely to be removed from their families, which is why our package of support, uh, not least the Scottish Child Payment, is important in that respect uh, too. But we must never be complacent. Uh, we must ensure that we do all we can to tackle gender inequality, inequality, to protect the human rights of everyone, because only if we do all of that uh, can we build the better society that all of us want. Miles Briggs to be followed by Emma Roddick. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, today is important. And I'd like to pay tribute to all the campaigners and cross-party working, especially with Neil Bibby and Monica Lennon and Marion Scott, who's also been mentioned to make today happen. Mothers, fathers and the adult adoptees have lived with this lifelong trauma, not often being able to develop and maintain relationships with the total feeling of rejection. So today is just the start of a healing process, but also a wider exposure of the medical practices which took place in our country during these times. The use of Stilbestrol, DES, as the First Minister has stated, has had lasting negative health impacts which need to be addressed and awareness raised around the impact the use of these drugs has had on mothers and children. So can I ask the First Minister what role the Chief Medical Officer in Scotland will now have to investigate and take for forward work on the medical practices used during this time and additional advice which now will be given to mothers and adult adoptees? First Minister. Well, I think all of us uh, have the utmost sympathy for any woman uh, who had their child uh, forcibly taken away. Uh, but that is added to uh, by the sympathy we have for the women who were prescribed uh, stilbestrol. Um, and it is, of course, important that they have access to the support and the advice that they need. Uh, the Chief Medical Officer, of course, will offer uh, such advice always on a, an independent uh, clinical basis, and I'm sure the Chief Medical Officer would be happy to correspond further with members about any advice uh, he considers appropriate. Uh, of course, uh, the most recent guidance, which was produced by the UK Health Security Agency, uh, is that routine cervical screening is appropriate for those who believe they were exposed uh, to uh, this drug, uh, and that applies in Scotland. Um, and in terms of la lasting health impacts, uh, I want to emphasise again today, as I did in my statement, the importance of women attending uh, both uh, routine breast and routine cervical screening appointments. Uh, but there is no doubt whatsoever uh, that these medical practices compounded the injustice that women faced uh, and is one of the reasons, are one of the reasons uh, why today's apology is so important and so long overdue. Emma Roddick to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I also thank the First Minister for her very powerful words, which are crucially backed up by a range of actions as well from the Scottish Government to support those who have been affected. Could I ask her for an assurance that the Scottish Government will continue to place lived experience at the heart of its approach to helping those who have been impacted by historic adoption practices? First Minister. Um, I will give that assurance, and I, I think I can give that assurance with confidence uh, on behalf of whoever succeeds me as First Minister. Over my years as First Minister, I have become ever more convinced uh, about the indispensability of lived experience in all of our policy making. Uh, but there are probably few areas where lived experience matters more uh, than on this one. I don't think any of us in this chamber, while our hearts are filled uh, with sympathy on behalf of the women who suffered this injustice, none of us can comprehend what that was like. And therefore, making sure that we hear directly uh, from those who are still with us uh, and who feel able to contribute that lived experience is absolutely essential. Uh, so I do give that commitment and I know whoever comes after me will honour that commitment because it is so important. Monica Lennon to be followed by Jim Fairley. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A veil of silence has been lifted today. So I add my voice to thanking the First Minister for making this apology on behalf of the Scottish Government and indeed on behalf of Scotland. 
This is a day of mixed emotions. Some people have been name-checked already, but I look around the gallery and I see Marion is here and Jano is here. Evelyn Robinson has indeed travelled from Australia with her son, who was born in this city in 1970 and was taken from his mother. Um, it is a difficult day for other adult adoptees. I know that, that Esther is here, that Fiona is here, and Marjorie is here, and so many more. And there will be people today not even realising that they too have been affected by this. There are so many survivors. So there's been so many good questions already, but I want to ask the First Minister if she agrees that after today, not just as a government, but as a parliament, we continue to work together on this issue to educate ourselves, because it was a lack of compassion and it was prejudice and it was complacency that made this happen. This week is a week when we are celebrating single parent families in Scotland. And when I was speaking to some media today, I said this happened because women did not have a wedding ring on their finger. We cannot be complacent. And there are people today who will say, well, why are we not talking about the 1980s and, and, and later dates? Because, as we heard from Lisa today about her experience, that happened in 1982, the year after I was born. So what can we do to continue to educate the people of Scotland about this? There's been a call to record some of this history in the, the Glasgow Women's Library. What else can we do, First Minister, to make sure that there is no complacency and it never again can something like this happen in Scotland. First Minister. Um, can I thank Monica Lennon for that question and for all she has done to bring us to where we are today. Miles Briggs and Neil Bibby have been referenced too. I, I thank them. I quoted very deliberately uh, some women in my statement because their words uh, can give an understanding to the, the horror of this much, much more uh, than any words of mine can. But I'm conscious in quoting some women uh, that there are many, many more uh, who weren't quoted, and I want to pay tribute to every woman, not just here in the gallery today, but every uh, woman who suffered uh, this injustice. It is important that we uh, recognise, Monica Lennon talks about 1982, we know that this was a routine practice up until the late 1970s, that does, mean, does not mean it didn't happen at all uh, after that. It is also important to recognise that as we describe this as historical, that we recognise that it is recent history that we are talking about. Um, Monica Lennon was referencing the man who I know is with us from Australia, but born here, born in 1970. I was born in 1970 to a young mother. Uh, this is not uh, history that is way, way past. This is in our lifetimes. And that uh, should also remind us and underline the importance of not being complacent. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we frequently discover across a whole range of issues that injustices uh, that we thought were long gone can reoccur uh, if we are not vigilant uh, and if we don't guard against that. So we must continue to learn. We must, on issues like this, I hope, continue to stand together. And we must find ways, while trying to bring some closure for those who suffered, uh, also finding ways to remember. Uh, I've heard uh, suggestions of a memorial in the Glasgow Women's Library. I cannot speak for the library. It's an institution I have huge affection and respect for. But I think we should be open to all of these suggestions to make sure uh, that we deliver as much justice as we possibly can, but that we never forget and we allow these horrendous experiences to stand as reminders of what happens if we don't uh, remember the value of our common humanity and if we don't protect uh, what matters most in our society. Uh, so I, again, give a commitment today, uh, knowing that it will be somebody else that takes it forward, but in confidence that this chamber will stay united in making sure that we do learn these lessons and we find the most appropriate ways of delivering support and always remembering. Jim Fairley, to be followed by Beatrice Wood. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, my constituent, Fiona Henderson, has been in regular contact with my office and I've been working with her. I believe she's in the chamber today for some months now. I should point out that I've asked her and she's happy for me to use her name in this question. Now, her name pre-adoption was Samantha Jane Penfold and her adoption has caused her severe trauma and anguish. So I'm asking this question on behalf of her and all those other adoptees who are suffering likewise. You the, sorry, the First Minister addressed the difficulties about access to adoption records. And while I recognise the sensitivities that exist in relation to this matter, the adult adoptees have been waiting a very long time for help. 
So what assurance can the First Minister give that the Scottish Government and its agencies are continuing to work with parents and adoptees to understand and hopefully overcome the barriers to, accept, to, to accessing those adoption records? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, my statement today uh, very deliberately um, and I think rightly directed an apology to mothers who had their children taken away, to fathers uh, who lost their children too, uh, but also to the children uh, who were uh, adopted as a result of these practices. And it is important that as we move forward from today, uh, we give support uh, to everyone whose lives uh, were affected. Uh, that, of course, uh, does mean uh, that we continue to support those uh, who want uh, and have had difficulties accessing adoption records. Uh, there are, uh, unfortunately, as we all know, some complexities involved in all of this, but it is important, nevertheless, that we overcome uh, these complexities, and I want to uh, given assurance today that we will continue uh, to do that. In the meantime, National Records of Scotland will continue to provide access and assistance uh, in line with current uh, legislation. Any changes here will need to be carefully uh, considered, but I want to give an assurance today that we are listening and will continue to listen to the very important and valid calls uh, that are being made for improvements in this area. Beatrice Wisher to be followed by Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the First Minister for advance sight of her statement and on behalf of Scottish Liberal Democrats echo its sentiments. Tens of thousands of Scottish women had their child forcibly taken from, from them and adopted, and I express my sympathy to all those who had to live with this wrong. The First Minister's formal apology acknowledges that the state was wrong, and it won't change what's happened, the pain or the hurt or the injustice, but I do hope it brings some comfort. Does the First Minister agree with me that it's incumbent on all of us to uphold women's and girls' human rights, ensuring that practices like this never happen again? First Minister. Uh, can I thank Beatrice Wisher for her question and for associating the Scottish Liberal Democrats uh, with the apology offered today? I think her question uh, goes to the heart of this issue. Uh, these practices were able to happen because of the inequality of women in our society and therefore part of making sure that injustices like this never happen again is to continue to progress and advance and secure women's equality um, and that is a responsibility for all of us uh, but it is a fundamental part of what we must do uh, to recognise uh, what happened in the past and to ensure that it can never happen again in the future. Evelyn Tweed to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the First Minister for her statement and apology today. It is very welcome. To ask the First Minister what support will be provided for those who have been impacted by forced adoption and to allow some closure. First Minister. Well, we have a special responsibility to those affected to do whatever we can uh, to support them in dealing with the legacy of what happened. Uh, we are, for example, already funding the charity Health in Mind uh, to establish specialist peer support groups to provide uh, support services that will be person-centred, trauma-informed uh, and crucially run by those with lived experience. Uh, and we've commissioned a scoping study, uh, as has been referenced already today, to explore further the support that those affected need uh, to assist them in the recovery process. Uh, all of that will help us understand uh, where we need to improve, introduce or enhance the services available to better meet the needs and expectations of those affected. Um, and I give an assurance again today that the Government is committed to that wider work. Maggie Chapman to be followed by Ros McCall. Mm -hmm. I thank the First Minister for her statement and apology and for giving voice to some of the women affected by this abhorrent practice. I, so I associate myself and the Scottish Greens with the Scottish Government's fulsome apology. The First Minister has indicated that some of those affected have already left Scotland. Some will have made a positive choice to go. Some will have felt they had no option but to leave the place that caused them so much shame and guilt. Can the First Minister confirm that the st study currently underway includes how best to work internationally across state boundaries to support reuniting families, and that it will include learning from how this has been done successfully elsewhere, and that we can share experiences so others can learn from us too? First Minister. Oh, well, again, can I thank Maggie Chapman for her question and for associating the Scottish Green Party with today's statement. Uh, she raises an important issue. Many uh, people who were subject uh, to these 
historical practices uh, will no longer be here in Scotland um, and therefore it's important that we ensure uh, that the work we are doing is where possible brought uh, to their attention. Uh, for example, further to delivery of this statement, we will be distributing copies to the networks of campaigners who have, uh, we have engaged with uh, throughout this work, uh, including those who live abroad, uh, so that they can issue to their members. And I would like to thank all of them again for their engagement today. But it is also important uh, that we continue to learn from other countries where that is appropriate. It has already been referenced today that an apology was issued in Australia uh, some years ago. Uh, so there will be examples of best practice elsewhere that it is important that we identify and learn from, as well as, I hope, here in Scotland, offering some best practice for others to learn from too. Ros McCall to be followed by Marie McNair. Thank you. And I align myself with comments of adoration for campaigners. The First Minister will be aware that I'm as passionate as anyone about these issues. As an adoptive parent, I cannot imagine going through this process to find out the adoption was forced. Having spoken to adult adoptees, they are looking for a comprehensive collection of relevant data and a commitment to develop specific funding mechanisms for bespoke developmental trauma-informed therapies. Now, assurances have been given, but I will ask again. As one backbencher to a soon-to-be backbencher, will the First Minister support and work with me to push for these fundamental changes with the new First Minister so that all these voices are finally heard with through Parliament? First Minister. Um, I certainly give a commitment uh, that this is an issue um, I will continue uh, to seek to advocate uh, from the backbenches of this chamber. It's not possible, and I know many members across the chamber have been involved in this issue uh, for longer than I have, uh, but it is not possible uh, to do the work uh, required leading up to the statement uh, today without uh, this issue uh, finding a place very deep in your heart um, and developing a determination uh, to continue to do everything possible to deliver as much justice as possible for those affected. Uh, as I said earlier on, uh, because uh, adult adoptees uh, were referenced in that question, the apology uh, delivered today is directed to all those uh, who suffered as a result of these abhorrent uh, adoption practices, um, from mothers uh, and fathers to the sons and daughters who grew up without their parents. There is a range of support uh, that those affected need now and will need in the future. I think it is important that we go through a proper process of identifying uh, what support is most appropriate um, and then making sure uh, that we act to deliver it. And uh, I've been privileged to be part of this as First Minister uh, and I'm absolutely determined that I'll continue to play my part uh, from the backbenches of this chamber. Marie McNair to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, President Officer. This is a historic day for those impacted by the inhumane practice of forced adoption. The First Minister really did speak for the people of Scotland with a statement that was ju with just uh, and made with compassion. My constituent, Jan o Farmer, welcomes this apology and she raises the point that many impacted now live out with Scotland and obviously the First Minister has um, outlined the steps, but can you maybe expand on that? First Minister. I think it is important uh, to recognise uh, that many will no longer live in Scotland uh, and therefore we do have a responsibility to make efforts. Uh, firstly, to ensure that today's apology reaches uh, all those uh, to whom uh, the apology is directed, wherever in the world uh, they may now be living. And I give an assurance that the Scottish Government will take all uh, reasonable practical steps to make sure that that is the case. Uh, but secondly, to make sure that as we are developing further uh, the support services that are necessary, uh, access to those support services uh, and knowledge of them is also extended to people in other parts uh, of the world. So we will continue uh, to do everything we reasonably can to ensure that this is the case. Uh, the last thing I would say in response to that question is I am under uh, no illusion uh, that an apology, however heartfelt it is, and it is very heartfelt, and I know I speak on behalf of all of us in this chamber when I say so, it can undo the harm, the damage, the trauma, the heartbreak uh, that has been suffered. So there is still much work to do uh, to try to address that in whatever ways we can, and I know uh, the government will continue uh, to be very, very committed to doing exactly that. And Jeremy Balfour. Uh, the First Minister will be aware that Marion and other campaigners have called for a permanent memorial 
to be erected here in Scotland. So has the Scottish Government thought of erecting such a permanent monument um, to remember this dark moment of Scottish history? And is this something that can be taken forward on a cross-party basis? First Minister. I, I think I uh, thank you to Jeremy Balfour for his question. I think I, I referenced this briefly in response to Monica Lennon. You know, today is first and foremost about an apology, and I think it is important that in this chamber today that is what we focus on. This apology has been a long time coming, um, and I think it is vital today uh, that we allow the space for that apology uh, to be received and understood. But it is also right that we consider uh, further important steps that we can take. We've uh, talked a lot uh, this afternoon. I have spoken a lot about the further support uh, that we must now develop and make available. But part of that is considering uh, proposals for an exhibition or a memorial. I think it would be wrong uh, for me to preempt uh, a proper process of consideration by uh, stating anything definitively today, uh, but I am very happy to say that the mind of the government is open uh, to this, and it is one of the issues uh, that we will seek to further discussions uh, with, uh, on with those uh, impacted by these practices. Thank you. That concludes the First Minister's statement on historical adoption practices, and we will move on to the next item of business in a moment or two.